other person's already had it imputed unto them. See, we understand that business realm better than we understand the spiritual realm. But Jesus did not impute sin unto you. God the Father didn't. Instead, he imputed it to his Son. Now, skip on down. I'm going to come back. But look in verse 21, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him, God the Father made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God imputed sin unto Jesus so that it would not be imputed unto you. If God held sin against you, then he would be unjust to Jesus or he would be charging double. He would be making Jesus pay for your sin, plus you have to pay for your sin. That's unequitable. That's double jeopardy. Jesus paid for all of your sins so that there should not even be a consciousness of sin in you. Second, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2, you, there should be no more conscience of sin. And the scripture we've already read in Romans chapter 8, verse 4, now the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in your born-again spirit. You are created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4, 24. Your spirit is righteous and holy and pure. And all of the ungodliness and the sin and the failure in our flesh was imputed unto Jesus. God isn't even holding it against you. This is one of the major, if not the major, difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant imputed sin unto you. It made you guilty. It made you condemned. The source of condemnation is the law. But in the New Testament, all of our sin was placed upon Jesus, and he is not imputing sin unto us. And sad to say, the vast majority of religion today is imputing sin to you and telling you that the reason God won't answer your prayers because you haven't done this and you hadn't done this and done this and God is holding it against you and until you straighten up, until you change this behavior, God won't bless you, God won't honor you, you got to do this in order to get God to do this. That is wrong. That is not the new covenant. That's the old covenant mentality. And we've been changed from that. We've got a new covenant with new commands. Man, those are radical, radical statements. So go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, be ye reconciled, we uh, pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. God gave us, ministers, this message of reconciliation. We're supposed to be telling people that God has already paid for your sins. You're reconciled to God. It's a done deal. Will you receive it? Will you accept it? Or are you going to insist on paying your own account? Are you going to insist on somehow or another feeling like you've got to pay for this? Or are you going to accept the good news that Jesus died for you and it's a free gift? That usually goes over about like that. Most of you are just sitting there thinking about this is different than anything I've ever heard. But this is what Scripture says. Man, I've used a lot of Scripture this morning. God has reconciled you unto himself by not imputing your trespasses unto you. He imputed them to Jesus. He put all of his wrath upon Jesus so that he's not mad at you anymore. If you could understand that, that's the difference between the old covenant, which did impute your sins unto you, and the new covenant, which imputed your sins unto Jesus. And they are incompatible. It's not sins being imputed to Jesus and to you. You can't share this responsibility. Jesus either bore it for you or he didn't bear it for you. But it can't be him bearing a little bit of it and you've got to accept some of it. 
This is what Jesus was referring to when he says you can't take a new garment and, I mean, an old garment and put a new patch on it. Because when you wash, wash it, it will shrink and it'll tear. You can't put new wine into an old wineskin because when it ferments, it'll break the bottles. What he was talking about wasn't how to protect your wine and how to mend your garments. He was talking about you can't take the New Testament realities and fit them into the Old Testament law. They're incompatible. They don't fit. There's a new way of relating to God under the new covenant with a new commandment. And we have to get to where we base everything on what Jesus did for us and who we are in the spirit and not relate to God in our flesh. And yet it's amazing how most of us, it's just like there's a default switch that we immediately go back to how we've acted and think God is going to move in our life proportional to our holiness. That is not true. Look over in Hebrews chapter 12. Here's a passage of scripture that is often used to say that you've got to be holy to have God move in your life. And it's not talking about a spirit holiness, a holiness that was received by salvation through faith in Jesus, but rather talking about your own holiness. In Hebrews chapter 12, it's talking about chastisement from the Lord, which I believe that there is chastisement, but it's not sickness, it's not disease, it's not poverty, it's not God killing your child, making your child be born with Down syndrome, that's not chastisement. The Bible says that the Word of God is quick and powerful, and it's the thing that divides. And it says over in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, I believe that the Word is, all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished. The Word of God is how He chastens us, who is with the Word. There's a right and a wrong way to chasten your children. You don't hit them with a board. You don't put cancer on them to teach you some, teach them something. There's a right way to correct your children. God gave you extra padding on your bottom for a reason. <laughs> and so, in the natural, we understand this. You don't hit your kids with something. You don't shoot them. You don't stab them to teach them something. There's a right and a wrong way to correct. Likewise, God doesn't hit you with sickness and disease and cause tragedy in your life. He uses His Word to correct you, and the Word will make you perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You don't have to have plan B or plan C. The Word of God is enough to make you perfect. Somebody said, but they aren't studying the Word. They don't listen to the Word. Well, then you can learn by hard knocks. You can go out there and let life beat you up, and you can learn. But I tell you, there's a better way. Better way is to go to the Word of God, and the Word of God will make you perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so here in Hebrews chapter 12, it says in verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the, all the hands which hang down in the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather, let it rather be healed. This isn't actually talking about walking in a straight line. This is talking about symbolically, uh, metaphorically, it's talking about that you're supposed to live a godly life so that people who are watching you and are trying to find out about God and see God, many of them can't see God because he's invisible. You're the only expression of God they're ever going to see. So you need to walk a holy life is what he's talking about so that other people, rather than the lame being turned out of the way, they can be healed by seeing your example. That's what he's talking about. And then in verse uh, 14, he says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And people take this verse totally out of its context and they say that you've got to be holy or you'll never see the Lord. God will never, you'll never approach unto God. You'll never have God do anything in your life unless that you're holy. Take it in its context. It's talking about chastisement and it says live a godly life so that people who are watching you can follow the Lord, can be brought to the Lord. And then in the midst of this, he says, 
uh, follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. This isn't talking about you seeing the Lord because you've been holy and you therefore deserve seeing the Lord. This is talking about if you don't live holy, how is anybody ever going to see the Lord in your life? This isn't talking about that you've got to be holy before you can see the Lord. It's talking about you've got to live holy or other people won't be able to see God in you. They won't ever learn anything from you. And the next verse, again, puts this back in its context. It says, looking diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness, etc. And it's talking about just live holy. Walk right so that the lame, instead of being turned aside, it'll be healed because they'll see the power of God in you. Live holy. Otherwise, how is anybody going to see the Lord in your life? I tell you, we have had Scripture just so twisted to fit a paradigm that we already have that God is this angry God that every time you mess up, God's not going to answer your prayer. And that's the way it was in the Old Testament. I intended to get into some different things this morning, but you know, praise God, I'll get into them tonight. I'm not through. I'll just cover it later. But I'm going to explain to you about why the Old Testament law was given and why God did it this way. But the Old Testament law made people sin conscious. It imputed sin unto you. It made you so condemned and so guilty. And that was never God's perfect will. That's the reason he waited for 2,000 years after man's sin before he gave the law. Because it wasn't a perfect system. As we read last night in Hebrews chapter 8, he found fault with the law. It never was God's best. But mankind had become so corrupted and so vile and so condemned that if God didn't do something to restrain the amount of sin... There wouldn't have been a virgin left on the earth for Jesus to have been born through. Sin was becoming so pervasive that the entire plan of God for redeeming mankind by grace was at risk. And God had to do something to literally scare the devil out of us. To make man turn from sin because sin was destroying the human race. So God gave the law not to help you. It helped in the sense that it took away your deception and showed you how guilty you were. But it made you condemned. It made you guilty. It made you run from God instead of to God. But it showed you that all of your self-righteousness and all of the goodness that you were trusting in was as filthy rags compared to God's standard. And it brought you to the end of yourself so that all you could do was look up and say, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. That's the purpose of the law. And if you use it for that purpose to show people their need for God and bring them to a place of salvation, then the law is good. But when it's bad is when after a person comes to the Lord and receives Jesus, and now they've got a new covenant and new promises, you put them back under the old covenant with the Ten Commandments that is still showing them how ungodly and how sinful they were. God never intended that. It was not intended for that. And sad to say, the church has been the number one promoter of the Old Testament law and legalism and God's wrath and judgment and punishment and rejection if you don't do everything right. And it shouldn't be. They're preaching the wrong message. They're preaching from the wrong side of the cross. You know, we've got a pastor that went to our Bible school in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and they sent a testimony to me. And this man has only been in school for, I don't know, six, seven months. And it has just revolutionized his life. It's revolutionized his whole ministry. And here's the way he phrased it. He says, I found out I was preaching from the wrong side of the cross. I was preaching the Old Testament law instead of the New Testament grace. And man, I think that's just a tremendous way of saying it. And this is basically what's happening to most of our churches is that they are preaching the wrath and the judgment and the conditional acceptance of God and conditional promises. You do this, this, and this, and then I'll do this. But in the New Covenant, Jesus meant all of the conditions. Jesus has already done everything. And the only way you can ever be reconciled unto God, be friendly and really enter into the relationship, is get out of this old covenant mentality and into the new covenant where you base everything on Jesus. God loves me because I'm in Jesus. 
God loves me because He is love, not because I am lovely. When you pray and say, in the name of Jesus, you're saying, Father, because of what Jesus has done, completely separate from what I've done. Completely separate from my own worthiness, my own goodness. I'm not basing this on the fact that I've been going to church or praying or doing anything. Just because of Jesus, in Jesus' name, I am healed. In Jesus' name, I am blessed. That's what praying in the name of Jesus is. It's basing your request upon what Jesus did for you. And yet the average person will say, in the name of Jesus, and then recite, God, I've been doing this, this, and this. Now will you move in my life? That's taking the name of Jesus in vain. That's terrible. And yet this is what religion has taught us to do. And we have become sin conscious because we're under an old covenant. And that is not what God intended. Like I said, I really wanted to go somewhere else this morning, but I just said all these things in getting there. Amen. <laughs> so uh, I'll really continue with this tonight and share what I was wanting to do. But man, there is so much in the Word about this. It's hard to put it concisely. And yet it's amazing. Religion has just missed this. I'd say that one of the most common comments that we get is people say, I've been a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years, whatever, and I've never heard this. This is contrary to everything I've ever been taught. Very few people are taught the new covenant. Romans 1.16 says, it, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of God. And the word gospel here has become a religious cliche, but it is talking about what we're talking about here. The new covenant. The fact that it's by grace and not by performance. That's what gives you power in your Christian life. If you know that God can heal, but you have no power to receive that healing, it's because you're lacking in the gospel. You're living under an old covenant instead of a new covenant. You're letting Satan condemn you because of some failure in yourself instead of standing strong in what Jesus has done and getting it by grace through faith. You may know that it's God's will to prosper you and you may do these things, but most people confess the word and do these things thinking this is going to make God move. See, that's not the gospel. You think that somehow or another you have pull with God and your holiness affects God. That's not true. It's only your faith, your acceptance or rejection of Jesus. And whether you are standing strong in what Jesus did for you instead of what you are doing. The only thing that Satan can condemn you over is you. And if you get into the spirit that is now born again and has been changed... There is no condemnation to you when you're in the Spirit and not standing in your flesh. It, there's no reason for you to have any condemnation. You shouldn't even have a sin consciousness but if you are in Christ because God has taken care of all of them. Past, present, and even sins you haven't committed yet have already been paid for. If I can talk fast enough, I'm going to deal with that either in the night or tomorrow morning. Your sins are all paid for. You shouldn't have a sin consciousness. And somebody's saying, oh man, the things you're saying is just turn people loose to go live in sin. You know what? If you could see yourself totally forgiven, cleansed, pure, and if you could ever get hold of this in the spirit, you would reproduce. As a man thinks in his heart, that's the, reason, that's the way that he is. If you could see yourself totally forgiven and cleansed, you would start living holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. Amen. The reason most people live in sin is because they see themselves as I'm an old sinner. Saved by grace. And so they just give token resistance. And if the temptation continues, well, after all, that's who I am. I'm just an old sinner. This is who I am. So they go act like it. If you could ever see yourself as totally forgiven and see how clean and pure and holy you are in the spirit, it would reproduce itself in your physical body. You would wind up living holy. You know, I'm glad God called me 
to preach this message because it takes away some people's criticism against grace teaching. Some people say, well, the reason you preach grace is so that you can just go out and live in sin and you can be a drunk and you can go commit adultery and you can go do this. And it's just a way of you justifying your lifestyle. You can't say that about me. I live holier than most of you. This did not cause me to go live in sin. It says in Titus chapter 2, I believe it's verse 12, that the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly and righteously in this present world. If you truly understand grace, and don't use it as an excuse to go live in sin, but if you understood how much God loved you independent of your performance, And how he got there by putting all of your sin upon Jesus. If you truly get a revelation of that, it will cause you to live a holy life. You will live holy, 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 but not in order to please God, but as a result of finding out how Jesus has already pleased God. You'll live holy as a byproduct. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending your son and thank you for condemning sin in the flesh of your son. Thank you for forsaking your son so that we would never be forsaken. Thank you for imputing our sins unto Jesus so that we would never have our sins imputed unto us. Father, thank you for the great salvation, and I'm just praying by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would help people here today to understand this and get out of this condemnation mindset and out of this legalistic thing where we've got to do all of these things to earn your favor. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would take these words and set people free from this, that we would begin to experience the new covenant. The power that's in the gospel. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come and touch our hearts, to change our thinking, to take the traditions and the doctrines of men that make the word of no effect and get those things out of us. Thank you, Father. We desire revelation from the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. There's a scripture in Luke chapter 24, verse 45, where Jesus was speaking to his disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they just couldn't understand. And it says, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. And I'm praying that today. I believe that's quickened to me by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is touching people's understanding so that you can understand this new covenant. That you can see the hope of our calling. Understand the greatness of this fact that Christ is in us, the hope of glory. Father, we pray for this revelation to come. And I thank you that you are performing miracles in people's lives. And that this word is going to burn on the inside of us until it burns up all of that traditions and doctrines of men. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we agree. We receive it. We welcome it and we receive this ministry of your Holy Spirit in this place today. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Father. You know, there may be some of you here today that maybe you've understood for the first time what really being a Christian is. It's not trying to change your life and be holy and all of these things. That comes as a byproduct once you already obtain relationship with God. But a true Christian is one that just puts their faith in what Jesus did for them. And we've got millions and millions of people who call themselves Christians their faith isn't in God. They're just trying to live by the Christian standard, the Christian rules of appeasing God. But in a sense, they're no different than a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu. 
They just have a Christian set of values that they are trying to do something to make themselves worthy in the sight of God. The thing that truly separates from Christianity from every other religion of the world is not our standard of holiness. Did you know that Muslims have a standard of holiness that if you steal, they cut your hand off? And they're very strict. It's not our standard of holiness that makes Christians different. The only thing that's different, the number one thing that's different about Christianity is we have a Savior. No other religion on the face of the earth has this concept of a Savior. In every other religion of the world, you have to be your own Savior. You have to earn God's favor by you performing and doing this and wearing a robe and shaving your head and begging or doing whatever it is. But in true Christianity, we have a Savior who came and took our sins. They were imputed unto him, and he suffered. And so all you've got to do is accept him and put your faith in him, and then you get in based on what he did for you, not based on your performance. Well, that's powerful. And sad to say, most Christians don't have that concept. They're just trying. They still have the same mindset as a Hindu, a Buddhist, anybody trying to be good enough, thinking that their good has to outweigh their bad. And maybe some of you in here have been confused by that, and today you've heard the gospel for the first time. That regardless of what you've done or haven't done, Jesus paid for all of your sins. And you could just receive salvation as a gift. You receive it by making Jesus your own personal Lord. And if you will do that, and do more than just say the words, you have to mean it. That I'm making my, you my Lord. I turn my life over to you. You can't do it perfectly, but you have to be willing to give him that kind of control of your life. And you trust him to that degree. When you do that then you become a new person on the inside and holiness becomes a fruit and not a root of salvation. It's a byproduct of having a relationship with God, not the way to having a relationship with God. If you've never done that today, you need to accept Jesus as your Lord. And then every person who's born again also needs the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, don't go tell anybody this tremendous news about Jesus being raised from the dead and the gospel. Don't tell anybody until you receive power from on high, when you receive the Holy Spirit. And when they received the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it says, they spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you get these gifts, not only speaking in tongues, but that's one of the visible ones, one of the very first ones. And you get this ability to speak in a language that you didn't learn with your mind. It comes out of your spirit. And you bypass all of the doubt and the unbelief that's in your mind. And you talk straight from this born-again spirit and are able to communicate with God. It is powerful. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongues, You need to receive that. And there may be people here, I said this last night, but there's people that, you know, came to this meeting not realizing I'm one of those that speak in tongues. Because I don't, you know, act like the typical Pentecostal and scream and shout and say glory to God. And so because of it, some of you didn't realize I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I am. And I tell you, you need this gift of speaking in tongues. And there's many of you that like... Think you, you like some of the things that I testify about how God raised my son from the dead after being dead for five hours. He was raised from the dead with no brain damage, no more than before. Amen. And you hear testimonies about miracles that are happening and good things that are happening, and you like the fruit, but you're going to reject the root and say, I don't want this baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. I'm telling you that the baptism of the Holy Spirit actually transformed my life. And any good thing that has happened in my life is a result of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongues. So I don't care what you've been taught about it. I'm telling you, it's real. And it works. 
And it's something that you need. If you don't speak in tongues, you need to receive speaking in tongues. You need to receive this power from the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody here today who would say, I need one or both of those. Either I need to receive Jesus as my Lord and or I need to receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand so I can pray with you. Here's some right here in the middle. Others, raise your hand if that's you. Praise God, we got hands all over the place. We had, I don't even know how many last night, but I'm, how many? 120 people came forward last night to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You know what? That's the same number that received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the upper room. And look what they did. can see another Pentecost happen right here. If you raised your hand, or if you were supposed to raise your hand but didn't do it, would you just get up out of your seat and come forward, and we want to pray with you and help you to receive right here. Come forward and let us pray with you and help you to receive. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I was made fun of the next day in the third grade because they could tell I'd changed. So I was truly born again. But you know what? I was 18 when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And my life changed more outwardly through the baptism of the Holy Spirit than it did through being born again. I'm not saying that it's more important. You've got to be born again first. But I'm saying as far as the outward manifestation, this is the most life-transforming thing you will ever experience. I believe that you are going to become stronger than horseradish through receiving this baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is going to change your life. Amen? Praise God. Isn't this awesome? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, before I can pray with you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you first of all have to be born again. You have to know that Jesus is your Lord. The Bible says Jesus is the one who gives the baptism, so you have to receive the giver before you receive the gift. Is there anybody up here who's not certain that you've made Jesus your personal Lord? We need to pray with you first and help you to receive Jesus and make sure that you're born again. Is there anybody? If that's you, I want you to raise your hand so I can see who you are and pray with you and help you to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. Anybody? Here's one right here. Anybody else? Anybody down here? Are you sure? I've already talked about this quite a bit today, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But you can't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit until you receive Jesus as your personal Savior. So here's another one. So here's two. Anybody else? Here's another one right down here. You know, you may not be sure. You may think, well, I hope I, I receive Jesus as my Savior. The Bible says that when you get born again, you have a witness in yourself, and you know that you have passed from death unto life. If this isn't something that you are absolutely certain of, if you're confident, you need to pray. All right here's another one. Here's a couple of more down here. Anybody else? Here's another one. You need to make sure this is life and death. Here's another one right here. Anybody else? Man, this is great. So there's about six or seven of you. I'm going to pray with you first. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's that simple. He's already paid for everything. He's already died for your sins. It's just a matter of will you make him your Lord. And you have to do more than just mouth the words. Yes, be a commitment. You can't live perfectly. You can't never live without a sin. But you have to be willing to turn your life over and to make Him the Lord of your life. So if you all are ready to do that, you can be born again by simply praying a real simple prayer. Isn't that awesome? I'm going to ask everybody here to repeat this prayer after me so that they won't feel like we're just listening to them. And if you will say these words and mean it from your heart, you'll be born again. Okay? Just say this. Say, Father, I'm sorry for my sin. 
I believe Jesus died to forgive my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I make you my Lord. I believe that you are alive. That you now live in me. I am saved. I am forgiven. Right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. You believe that? Awesome. Awesome.